Appamata and its programs are supported by your generosity and your generosity and support makes such a difference. You can find a link for contributions on the website at appamata.org. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me. It's so good to to be with all of you. I was speaking to uh, Kim the other day and confirming uh, just uh, the timing and uh, saying, "Oh, we it'd be five a.m. here for me." And I see my buddy Ed, and I said, "Oh, it's just like going to uh, Sushen or uh, an intensive. Get up about this time." And so it's a it's a beautiful, uh, quiet morning here, and it's just a joy to see your faces and to be with you. I see so many of you at uh, inquiry, but it's a different feeling to um, to be privileged to offer the Dharma talk in a, both into the Zendo and into the larger world of our uh, our beautiful community. A little, a little context. I this past week, I did. I wanted to meet with all of the Appamata councils uh, who are uh, supporting and encouraging and carrying forward uh, the work of our sangha in Austin, and uh, which includes, of course, the the folks who are in the council that makes this possible hybrid uh, experience and does such a good job. And we spoke about many things, um, as you might imagine, um, including how the Dharma is being held and expressed uh, within the Sangha, in the little square that you see that's the building there in Austin, and then this larger online hybrid Sangha. And how these things are being carried forward by all of you especially now that Peg and I are no longer in residence. And as I was uh, meeting with everyone, and uh, we had a, a beautiful conversations, um, as often happens, uh, a, a line kept coming from some of the more traditional teachings that um, just kept coming up. And it was um, the opening line from one of our ancestor poems the Song of the Jewel, or the Song of the Precious Mirror Samadhi, which was written by Dangshan, who was a ninth century um, amazing uh, and important teacher in, in our lineage in China, in Chan. In Japan, we know him as Tozan. Uh, in Chinese, his name is Dangshan Yangji, or in Japanese, uh, Tozan Ryokai. And the opening line, many of you are quite familiar with, uh, the teachings of thusness have been intimately communicated by Buddhas and ancestors. Now you have it, so keep it well. And in the reminder that went online for today's talk that Jessica sent out, I said, why don't you just put that line in there? Uh, maybe it'll be a little prompt or an encouragement. So I'm sure some of you have seen that. <clears throat> And the, the line, um, when I asked her to, to put it in the email, I didn't know what I would talk about. <laughs> it's just that the line wouldn't leave me alone. So I thought I would stay with it and see what it was asking of me. So, so here we are. And in that spirit, I want to also say a couple of things about the way one meets these things. Um, there's a word that we don't use very often uh, that comes from uh, Japanese Zen, the word teisho, T-E-I-S-H-O, uh, would be the English um, teisho. <clears throat> and it just means the teacher's direct presentation of the Dharma. But it's not a, a teisho isn't a sermon or an academic lecture. It's, it's more of... Um, who's ever in this seat offering their heart um so it's not about 
teaching some factual knowledge. It's interesting because in Japanese, the words literally mean presentation of the shout. Isn't that interesting? Uh, it sounds a little dramatic, but presentation of the shout. Um, but I love the way it's spoken about. Um, one teacher said it's it's a return of insight to its source the return of insight to its source. So it's dynamic, it's alive, it's relational. It's not so planned or constructed as a, as a lecture might be. And there's also, curiously, um, something similar in the Tibetan tradition, uh, not exactly the same, but uh, something called a doha, D-O-H-A. And this is a song a realization or a, a poem uh, um, that usually acknowledges some encounter with a teacher, like a guru or lama, and it explores some particular aspect of wisdom or uh, teachings that's transmitted, and, and often it's kind of like a call and response. It's very relational. Um, again, you know, returning this to the source and expressing the Dharma. So uh, maybe you haven't heard of these two things, and I thought they were quite interesting because it's, uh, in a way, um, the manner in which I entered speaking to you today. That opening line, the teachings of thusness, sometimes suchness, the teachings of thusness have been intimately communicated Thusness or suchness suggests, if, if you're not familiar with the word, um, the nature of reality free from conceptual elaborations, and kind of a subject object dualism. So, this is the spirit in which, which we arrive. And, and like in so many um, Zen settings, let's start with a story. Uh, and it's a story that so many of you are, are familiar with. And it's a story of the, the author of um, the Song of the Jewel Mirror Samadhi, Dongshan. And <clears throat> it's the, in some ways, I think it's the enactment of returning of insight to its source and taking a dialogue beyond conceptual distinctions. So in this old story, when Dongshan was about to leave his teacher to, to go forward, uh, his teacher was Yunyan. He said, like, like you might say, uh, if you were leaving, like later on when somebody asked me, like, what your teachings were to, to depict the reality you were trying to express, what would I say? What would I reply? And Yunyan paused, and then he said very famously, just this is it. Just this is it. And when he heard that, Dongshan kind of sank into a reverie, as you might, I might, when I heard, it's like, what? And But Yunyan followed it up immediately by saying, you are in charge of this great matter. You must be thoroughgoing. Now you are in charge of this matter. You must be thoroughgoing. Now all of you are in charge of this matter. You must be thoroughgoing. And Dongshan did leave as he had intended to do, and he was still a bit perplexed. Um, he didn't quite get it, and but as he proceeded on his way, this it was working in him, like that phrase was working in me, and and he was wading across the stream on his journey, and he looked down and he could see his reflection in the water, and when he saw his reflection, it was some some deepening of his understanding. He looked down and saw his reflection coming back to him, maybe moving and shifting. You know how it is when the stream is moving. And this is the poem he 
he later wrote down. Just don't seek from others or you'll be far estranged from yourself. Now I go on alone, but everywhere I meet it, it now is me. I now am not it. One must understand in this way to merge with suchness. So it's a little bit strange language. Just don't seek from others or be estranged from yourself. Now I go on alone. He's left his teacher. But everywhere I meet it, just this is it. Everywhere I meet it, it now is me. I now am not it. One must understand in this way to merge with, with suchness, with the non-conceptual reality in which we're immersed. So Union's words has really sunk in. The um, an imminence and immediacy of what it was like to be with Yan Yan, Yun Yan, um, was going deeper. And in the moment of seeing his reflection in the water, Dongshan understood that the image of himself, in this case, he looked at the reflection, but the image he always carried, the image of himself he had held was never the whole story. But at the same time, it was the entirety of his own being. It now is me. I now am not it. Like the way I understood myself and held myself was very, it doesn't really hold together in the way that I thought it did. And yet, that construction and that holding and that realizing is the totality of my being. The image you, of yourself you hold is not the whole story. But thusness and suchness of all of your story and all the ways you hold yourself is the completeness, is your entire being, boundlessness, manifesting in this particular way as your body now. And the images and ideas you hold of the Sangha, of each other, of teachers, is never the whole story. Because our images and ideas are never the whole story. It's not that we're wrong. It's just partial and provisional. And yet, at the very same time, what we're living together is the totality of thusness and suchness. What else could it be? Just this is it. So that's the background story. And later, Dongshan wrote this song of the jewel mirror samadhi or a jewel of the precious mirror samadhi uh, so in some ways like a, a doha it's a song um, about samadhi about awakening about stepping beyond the gates of ordinary um, ways of being and it's like a jeweled mirror he used that image of a mirror uh, or a precious precious mirror so i'm not going to go through the whole thing, because that, that would be a different thing we could do in a class or in a longer retreat. But since that first line had grabbed me, and it's an expression of this old story, uh, I thought it would be worth speaking about just five lines within uh, his poem, and how they expressed um, The, the beauty of what I experienced this past week meeting with all the councils and how I could see it uh, being enacted and how it's alive uh, within what we're all doing together. So that first, that first line, excuse me, the one that, that got me here, <laughs> the teaching of thusness has been intimately communicated by Buddhas and ancestors, now you have it, so keep it well. 
these the teachings which in Zen are the teachings of thusness, uh, suchness that take us beyond uh, the everyday have been intimately communicated. Now you have it, so keep it well. Uh, I've I've told some of you there's um, a, a beautiful framed piece of calligraphy at um, at City Center at San Francisco Zen Center in, in the city. Um, and I always remember it. I don't know if it's still hanging. Um, they're about to redo that building. It's going to be closed for a year. Uh, but I always remembered it because it's the calligraphy for thusness or suchness, the character. And that's always beautiful. But what's interesting is the way it was done. Um, and as I look at Jim, I'm thinking about, <laughs> you'd love this, Jim, uh, because the way it's done is the the piece of paper isn't, a long piece like you see a scroll it's long this way horizontally and the way the character is done i have to enact because that's what it expresses it's like this it's like this and then oh. it's really really beautiful you know when dong shan heard his teacher he began to digest it a little bit. And then Yun Yan, you know, in the story, he followed up really quickly before Dong Shan could really do much. He said, you are in charge of the great matter. You must be thorough going. We're just, I'm, I've given you the teachings. You're going to take them. And thorough going is kind of an archaic word. I don't know about you, but I've never, um, I've never heard it much, but that, that whoosh, that suchness, that stepping further. Um, because it means passing or extending all the way through. Thorough. Going. Passing or extending all the way through. And attending to things in great detail. Not missing anything. You must be thorough going. And each one of you, no matter where you live, or what sangha you call home, you begin to take in and digest the teachings that we offer you and the ones that you find in all the ways that we find teachings these days, in a magazine, online, with each other, reading together. And when you leave, or you change circumstances, or you move, or whatever, you have to remember that, as Yunyan said, you are in charge of this great matter. You must be thoroughgoing. This is a strange thing. As a as a teacher, when I'm in this role, I'm not the only one taking the bodhisattva vows. You know, in the in the old ways and in some other traditions, like the the priests do the thing, and then everybody else they, for the sangha. You know, certainly in Catholicism and some others, but this is not true for us. I'm not the only one taking the bodhisattva vows. We're all taking those vows. And each person has to live them out in their own way, even if there's a robust, loving community with a lot of people. The teachings or the dharma of suchness or thusness is intimately communicated. It's always being communicated, it's conferred or transmitted by Buddhas and ancestors. Now you have it, preserve it, take it forward. In other words, Take care of the teachings and take care of each other. Our practice is not about getting something new or arriving in some new place, but about taking care of something that we already have. And now that you've heard this or seen it or felt it, you have it. It's yours. So our practice is, how do we take care of this? And this, and this, just this is it. How do we take care of this? And then this, and then this. In the meetings I had last week, I heard person after person saying that they uh, came and served on the councils because they wanted to give something back. 
They had gotten so much, they wanted to offer something back and take care of the Sangha, which is so precious to them. The precious samadhi, the precious mirror, the precious jewel. And to participate really fully, not stand aside. And this is the case now with all of you, just as it was with Dangshan. You know, in the story, after being uh, sort of admonished, now you have it, you're going to have to be thorough going with it. And, and Dongshan left, he was still a little confused and um, maybe, do any of you know what it feels like? Or imagine what it's like if if you have left or if you feel like you've been left and then you feel confused or questioning about how to proceed. See, this was Dongshan. And as he proceeded on his way, he was crossing the territory that he had to cross and waded across the stream. And, and in, in his daily activity, he was reflected back to himself. It happened to be in a stream. But those reflections, you know, like when you walk down the street and you see, see the store window and you see this person walking by that you don't recognize at first. And then you realize, oh, I really look like that walking down the street. Uh, you begin to see something. You get reflections of our, of our actions because we pay attention or, or our friends like this are reflecting us back. We can see it in their faces and in our relationships. And so that's when Dong Shan looked down the stream and wrote that, that poem. You just don't seek from others or you'll be far estranged from yourself. Now I go on alone, but everywhere I meet it, it now is me. I Now I'm not it. One must understand in this way to merge with suchness. And I, I don't think he's writing a poem about um, step away from the Sangha and go on your own. He's saying, you have to do the practice. And yet, everywhere you go, you're going to meet it all. Each of us takes our vows. Each of us has to live the precepts. Each of us has to do that. No one's going to do it for you. Each person has to live them out in their own way. Even within a loving community. And this is the embodied inconceivable. This is thusness showing up as a body, as our body, as the Sangha body. One must understand in this way to merge with suchness, Dong Shan said at the end of the poem. One must understand in this way to merge with su suchness, to not, not be separated from this reality which goes beyond description. So this this mysterious mechanism, this uh, wondrous opportunity, this um, what's functioning in the sort of transcendent realm arrives very simply and quite naturally as ordinary life, and we live it out. So all this ordinariness is also the complete expression of empty, the emptiness of all things or the, the completeness of all things. The sublime completely expressing itself in the mundane. And that is thusness. And this is consistent with the Mahayana um, teachings in our tradition that these two views are both present, working together, and they're just views. They're not actually different. We begin to realize that a nirvana is right in samsara. Samsara is the enactment of nirvana, form and boundlessness, form and boundlessness, expressing suchness, thusness. And rather than trying to sort it all out, we express and celebrate this truth through upright sitting 
in the midst of our everyday activity. This is what our practice is about. This is our zazen. And it's especially true for all of us because I, I don't think any of us that are here today live in monasteries. We live in the everyday world. And yet we can practice in this way with uprightness. We're immersed in the conventional mess. <laughs> Gosh, all you have to do is turn on the news, but not even that, to this mess of greed, hate, and delusion. And we knowingly, as we practice, enter this muddy world and choose, you know, what I call this uh, existence as a messy miracle of human life through, through, in some ways, doing something so simple as sitting upright in zazen to celebrate and express just this is it. We're not sitting to get somewhere. And we also do it by taking care of the Sangha. And as we come back to this uprightness and care for each other, assist each other in being upright, then our experience and our willingness, like the folks coming into the councils were telling me, makes a real difference in the world in which we live. In a recent interview, in the, the most recent um, edition of Tricycle, uh, there's a, a beautiful smart, uh, small interview with Jane Hirschfield, you know, wonderful um, poet. And uh, because she's just published a new collection, I, I love the title, The Asking. The Asking. And she says in the interview, Zen is continual asking, not a set of answers. Zen is continual asking, not a set of answers. With each breath, what is this? What is this? And then we're with Dongshan and Yunyang. You hear me say it often, Zen does not answer your questions. It questions your answers. Another way of saying this. And then in the interview, she spoke about um, how in the Soto tradition, we don't practice with koans in exactly the same way in, as in Rinzai, but because we have to find our own questions. And then she said, for a long time, mine, her, her question was, what is the emotional life of a Buddha? And I very much resonated with that because of the work that I do. What is the emotional life of a Buddha? But she went on to say, but these days, most often, it is the simple, and it's interesting how she said it, and it was because it's not exactly grammatical. She said, instead of what is the emotional life of Buddha, now her question is, how go on? And then she said, how to stay undefended, unbarricaded, permeable, in the face of so much pain and loss and delusion. She said, perhaps another way to phrase my current question might be, how can I open further into what is? And once I have, what is given me then to do? And this question, I think, is all of our questions, if we are engaged in Sangha relations, on a council or not, how can I open further into what is, and once I have, what is given me then to do? I said I would speak about uh, several lines within the Jewel Mirror Samadhi, so I'm going to just name a few more after that first opening line about the teaching of thus has, has been intimately communicated. Further down, one of my favorite lines is, the meaning is not in the words, yet it responds to the inquiring impulse. So we try to look for meaning. And we want it to be in the words, to be described. And he's saying the meaning isn't in the words. 
yet the, the, it responds to the inquiring impulse. Like there's something that's calling, something that's longing. There's something that leans somewhere or receives. There's the inquiring impulse, the impulse to ask the questions, the asking, the asking. And I can't tell you how many times in each meeting someone would say to me this past week, because that, one of the questions that I asked was, why are you here? Why are you doing this? What brought you? What, uh, what brought you to, to be on a council? And so many people would say, well, you know, I was invited and I said, yes. I said, yes, to the invitation. And that's, that's the entry point into practice. This, what's calling us, the inmost request, Suzuki Roshi called it, and to say yes to it. The inquiring impulse. What is this? What is my life? What, what am I doing here? And to say yes. Even if you don't know what you're saying yes to. When I had that line going through my head, I said, yes, uh, I'll follow you. Not knowing that I would do this, I had no idea. And, and everyone in every single group talked about the beauty of spiritual friendship the relationality, the meaning, well, the meaning isn't in the words. We have to use them. It's in the inquiring impulse. And then we meet these mirrors, our friends. Which brings me to the next line. I'm skipping way into the poem. Dongshan said, it's like facing a jewel mirror. Form and image behold each other. You are not it. It actually is you. This is like that understanding you had in the stream. It's like facing a jewel mirror. Can you imagine a mirror that's made out of jewels? <laughs> this is a silly thing, but I always think of it as like a disco ball. You know, it's like multiple <laughs> reflections that spread everywhere. It's like facing a jewel mirror. Form an image, behold each other. You know, like in those fun houses where there's mirrors, you know, there's infinite reflections of yourself, looking at yourself. The way I think about it is this, it's, this, this thing is called the Song of the Jewel Mirror Samadhi. So it's a song or a poem about Samadhi, which we only come to understand through this precious or jeweled mirror. What is the reality in which we find ourselves? It's this and that and this and that. It's, it's all around us. It's like a jewel reflecting an infinite number of expressions. It's like facing a jewel mirror. Form and image behold each other. You are not it. It actually is you. Uh, another phrase that someone used this week in the meeting, they said it's, being in the council is like entering the circle of the way, not to. There's all these people and all these things to do. And yet, it's, it's like in the Shin Shin Ming, we're not exactly two. We're not one, because we're separate and individual, yeah, but we're also not exactly two. Form and image are beholding each other. And this was often followed by some expression like, in these small parts of the Sangha, we take the time and then we make the space for relationships to open. And that's what we're doing here. And that's what we're always doing with each other. Even if we're simply sitting next to someone in Zazen, we're taking the time and making the space for relationships to open the flower. I'm so impatient with my garden. There are times when I want the flower to open faster or I want the palm to grow taller. I have to take the time and make the space for relationships to open. Remember the image of who you are in the Sangha and the Sangha you meet is never the whole story. But at the same time, it is the entirety of our own being expressing itself. And this is who we are. 
Line number four. This one's dizzying. Subtly included within the true, inquiry and response come up together. Communing with the source and communing with the process, it includes integration and includes the road. So in this, whatever image you have, within suchness and thusness, inquiry and response come up together. We should have that as the line on inquiry on Tuesdays, right? It's like, what's what's this question? What's the answer? They, 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 they meet, they come together. They require each other. And in that requirement, in that relationship, um, we commune with the source and we're engaged in the process of relating, communing with the source and communing with the process. It includes integration and includes the road. It includes the way we become what we become while we're doing it. And it's also the path. I know we can unpack this one a lot. It's quite a bit, but in the groups, I was I kept hearing the road of joyous opportunity and sometimes burdensome duty shows up. Oh, there's this joyous opportunity to work within the Sangha. And sometimes it's like, oh, great, one more. And it, it, it can get dull. It can, it can uh, the life can drain out of it. And then we can feel resistance. Other times we feel like we're inspired. This is the road. This is the source and the process. This is the questions and responses that come up. Subtly included within the true is this whole thing. Joyous opportunity, burdensome duty, resistance, return and inspiration. And one person said, this is a place in these small groups where we hold loss and transition, where we can actually meet transformation and have a container for it. We hold each other. And that's true of the larger Sangha too. And the last line I want to mention <clears throat> from the poem, and you can find this in our chant book, by the way, and you can also find it online on the website, the whole poem. When erroneous imaginations cease the acquiescent mind realizes itself when erroneous imaginations cease the acquiescent mind realizes itself erroneous imaginations Oof. we have plenty of those right and when they just simply soften and begin to quiet Uh, the, the, the fullness of our mind begins to realize itself. Another person in one of the meetings this week said, you know, this is a place where we can bring ourselves fully with all of our vulnerability and be met with some safety. And when things get difficult, because it's not all lightness and ease when things get difficult and we run into each other and we have difficult times. The embodied experience of being held also helps us move into and the embodied experience and the real power of repair. What it's like to meet each other when it's difficult and broken and, and learn what it's like to repair because that deepens our intimacy. We have many fixed views and they can be met more flexibly and held more lightly. And then we can meet another fixed view and open it. And there's this constant opening, bringing ourselves to others who care about us and will listen to us, finding ways in which we encourage and support each other, finding ways we have discord or differences, and then find repair because our deeper longing uh, is for a way to continue to be more thoroughgoing together. So if we go through these five statements that I've pulled out, Tozan tells us in the Song of the Precious or Jewel Mirror Samadhi that 
one. We begin, we've been given everything. You've been given everything. And it's up to you to take care of what you've been given. And that second line, and when we open to what is called for, or, or called forward maybe, naturally, with our questions, our inquiring impulse, we face the myriad forms that come up and know in our gut deeply that each thing is sh shaping and creating everything else and everything is continually being born and dying together and that we're creating each other and we're dying together so we can follow our breath take care of our body and take care of each other as a Sangha body. And the way of awakening will open on its own if we do that, not towards some special culmination and a perfect community. But in this world that is changing without end, so that the last line, when erroneous and self-centered ideas fade when erroneous and self-centered ideas fade the mind that's ready to say yes and is willing to go along with reality begins to realize itself and when we loosen the grip of our self-created suffering when we loosen our grip on self-created suffering and step into the flow with some flexibility and openness, then big mind just shines forth. One of the things that was spoken about in one of the groups was this desire to continue the creative aspirations that they saw in Peg and in me and all the other teachers um, and to take this creative aspiration that we brought and take it further as the Sangha matures and to take real deep ownership of what it means to carry this forward wherever we are in whatever small group or whatever aspect of the Sangha. In October, when Peg is there in Austin, and many of you will still be, in, of course, connected uh, intimately in this hybrid way, uh, there'll be an additional ceremony uh, which was sort of woven into the entrustment ceremony for our three entrusted teachers uh, that we currently have. But I, th I think it needs to be made more explicit. Uh, we did this in Madison with Suzanne, and it was, it was lovely. There is a teacher entrustment ceremony, which is the teachers and trusting a person said, here's the Dharma, now you have it, so keep it well. But there's another ceremony called the teacher installation ceremony. But then the Sangha, that's from the senior teacher to new teacher, but then in the teacher installation ceremony, it's a little bit like the Shuso ceremony, where the Sangha says, we want you to teach. And that part's not been done. And so I want you to think about this and maybe talk about it among yourselves and in your groups. Because in that ceremony, like in the head student ceremony that you've seen, where the Shu So will come forward and will say, uh, you know, please be our teacher. And they say, oh, I don't know. But there's a request. When the person enters the Zendo in that ceremony, one senior student says to the incoming head student, we've chosen you, we want you to be our head student. And so in this teacher installation ceremony, you're going to be asked as a Sangha to affirm that these are the teachers now and to ask them to do so. So that it's important to consider it deeply. One final comment that really struck me, um, and it came in different forms from a few people who had been very deeply involved in various Sanghas and various traditions other than Apamata. 
And the statement was very clear and very powerful. They said, oh, we've had a lot of experience and we've never seen so much love in a Sangha. We've never seen so much love in a Sangha. And everything that goes with it. <laughs> Um, that statement from the Course in Miracles that says love brings up everything unlike itself. And it does. But it requires that love for it to be brought up. And so back just to one last bit from the Hirschfield interview, which I was really taken by because I, I love her work. At the very end, the interviewer, um, and the interviewer had a great name, Wendy Biddlecombe Agsar. Is that a great name? So the interviewer said at the end to Jane, what do you hope readers and writers and the world might take away? How can we ask more? You know, what, would, what would you want them to take away? And Jane said, this question holds beautifully its own answer. The shift from fixity assertion and shouting into the shift into a spirit of asking and dialogue is itself the key asking turns the heart gate from closed to open what a gift she says a life's bi-directional q and a with the immeasurable what is. Exactly what we've been talking about. Form and image behold each other. Precious jewel, precious mirror. Life's bi-directional question and answer. Inquiry and response come up together. Questions and answers and the immeasurable what is. Just this is it. And then she ends by saying, my advice to young writers is often, open the windows a little wider than you feel comfortable. My advice in practice is to ask each thing, each event, every person you meet, what is your teaching? Now you have it. So keep it well. You must be thoroughgoing. Be willing to face the mirror. Help each other remain upright. So I'm not quite sure <clears throat> about our timing. Um, and if maybe we have a little time, if somebody has a question or a comment, I, I'll defer to the the leaders in the Zingo, Zendo who are holding the space. Um, can you help me? Um, you'll need to unmute in the Zendo. Thank you. And you have... Would you like to take the time to open the time for questions? And by the way, um, you, you, you're very um, accustomed. Uh, it's a little dark here this morning, of course. The sun's not even up. You're accustomed to seeing me in this setting, but you notice I changed the I moved the altar out. Uh, I found this beautiful stick, which looks like one of those sticks that an old Chinese Zen master would carry. You know, but I found it on the beach. It's beautiful, and it's active it's live it's that dynamic you know and then can you see the little plum bomb oh. so it seemed to express these two sides that we're talking about the dynamic and the upright and i'd seen one of those plum bombs uh, because judy myers had um, bought one and it was in Mexico where I was staying when I was teaching and I just loved it. It just was so and so I went online to see if I could find one and the one that I have I found it on Etsy or something they're unique little things, they're old 
And they said, well, this one was made in 1951. Well, that was the year of my birth. <laughs> and then the, the mala that's hanging here was brought to me as a gift by one of my students who went on a tour with Andy Ferguson. Some of you may know his work. He's written like the book on the lineage from Chan into Soto Zen, all the ancestors. And so uh, he took people on tours to China, actually to see the old places that are still extant that haven't been de destroyed. And that's from Dongshan's monastery mm -hmm. that still remains. So I thought a little, um, a little artistic montage of what we're talking about, historical. Any questions or comments from today? Yeah, Mehdi. Or he's just saying, yay. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shurian. No, you've had enough? Ed has a question. Oh, someone in, let me, I have to put it on. Okay. It was, I, you're so tiny, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, could you speak a little bit about the couplet in Dongshan's poem after his realization in the stream where I can't remember exactly the wording. Um, it is me, I am not it, or something like that. I, mean, I don't, I'm lost with the second part of the couplet. I was afraid you'd ask that. <laughs> It's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the best, best I can understand it, <clears throat> and maybe someone is better at teaching this than I am, certainly. <clears throat> you, in, the, in the poem, it's you are not it, it actually is you. Uh, which is, I think, in the in the poem, it says, um, "It now is me, and now am not it." That's what it was in the in the first little poem. In the larger poem, it says, "There's something different." Is it, are we on the right track here? Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But what you didn't hear is Anne just kind of sighed in this beautiful way when you read the poem again. <laughs> Thought yeah. that might be good information. <laughs> the suchness that we sometimes are privileged to open to and realize when we drop self-concern and we open to this larger space, which is available to us all the time. It's our natural state. <clears throat> it now is me. It's like, oh. That's always been the case. Even though it doesn't feel like it, it doesn't seem like it. We have those moments where, uh, that's why I think we call it an opening. Instead of thinking, I, it's strange, now it is me, now I am not it. it it's not, um, I'm not trying to be something. And yet my limited, funky view of myself that I play out in the world is the full expression of reality. Because I've been created by everything and there's nothing missing. Uh, but it's not held within just this one. It's, it's held in all of, you, you see how it begins to fall apart. It's hard to hold. But it's not, it's saying, oh, I, my little self is not it. And yet this little self is the expression of everything. Hmm. Well, maybe that's a good one to end on. <laughs> <laughs> if you can ask me something else, it's gonna be a bit more complicated. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. 
Marvelous. to be with you and to uh, to meet with so many people this week online and in person. Well, all online for me, but uh, there and to uh, uh, to be captured by a, a line that all those meetings and then to follow the line in the asking. Uh, so that's thank you for uh, supporting my practice in that way. Mm -hmm.